Hello. If you are interested in securities lending, repo and collateral management, if you want to learn about some of the new market entrants that are influencing and shaping the future of the business, then this is the place for you. Uh, we'll be meeting today three firms that are trying to solve the problems of today to make it a better tomorrow. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is another episode of Securities Lending Live with Pierpoint, and thanks very much for joining us. Um, as always, we want you to put a comment in. Tell us where you're actually watching from so we can see um, where people are, are viewing and uh, participating from. We usually get uh, quite, a, uh, quite a range, quite a global audience for this. Um, so thanks very much. The objective of these events is to discuss relevant topics and themes and give you, the viewers, a chance to participate in the discussion. So by definition, these, li these events are, are live and they are open. Uh, so if you have a comment, if you have a question, please put it in. If you haven't been able to join us live, watching it on, um, on replay, that's great. We love it. Um, uh, the benefit, obviously, of being live is uh, like John uh, Southgate, who's joined us uh, uh, from Highbury, so, so miles away, miles away, but not that far. Uh, thanks, John, for joining us. So he'll have a chance to actually put any comments or questions in, and, and John's participated in the past. So we, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, David, Ludmilla, great regular visitors. Uh, we've got Dublin, the first non-UK entrance. So thanks, Ludmilla. Uh, and uh, David in the UK as well. So uh, look, we'll have a chance to do this. Uh, you can see this on replay on both LinkedIn uh, and um, Facebook, but sometimes it's hard to find them. So we always store these uh, after a few days uh, in YouTube. You have a chance to actually go back to it there. Um, now, practically what happens is I'm a host and producer. So as I always say, if I'm not looking directly at you, and my eyes are over there, my eyes are over there. It's not because I don't love you, because I love every one of the viewers that takes their time to spend it with us. It's because I'm looking at different screens and different bits of information. So um, there's a delay between you putting comments in, like uh, Oliver, hi to you. Uh, he probably put that <laughs> a few minutes ago. And we renamed his location, and it's now the Polynesian island of West Malling because I thought that was a, a, a good name for an island in, uh, in, in, the, in that area of the world. Uh, so, look, I'm now going to uh, ask panelists to introduce themselves, uh, and I'm doing all this stuff. Well, I should say that uh, Guido Strömer is having a, a, a few technical difficulties with, with the link that I sent him. So I'm hoping that he'll be able to join us uh, shortly um, and uh, and sort of jump in at the time. Uh, Olina, hello from uh, New Zealand, always our visitor from furthest away, and she's a lecturer in in finance. And I have to say, just given the the LinkedIn description, I want to be one of your students. Um, right. So now we'll do this in alphabetical order. Boaz, maybe you can introduce yourself, please. Yeah, great. And, and thanks for having me. Um, my name is Boaz Yari. I'm the founder and CEO of ShareGain. Um, 44, uh, living in London for 11 years. And uh, yeah, doing great things in securities finance. Great. Thanks, Boaz. And Gareth? Hi, Gareth Mitchell. I'm co-founder of Connection Markets. Uh, I've spent well, far too many years working for various banks um, in the agency lending space. The last place I was at was City for 18 years, where I was the EMEA head of agency lending and the global trading head of agency lending. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gareth. And now to my lovely and talented colleague, uh, John. Good morning, everybody. Uh, John Anderson. I'm a consultancy lead for uh, PeerPoint. As with Gareth, I spent far too many years with a strong agency lending background. So thanks, John. And look, let's let's just sort of jump right into this. <clears throat> John, it was actually your idea when we were brainstorming for this session to um, invite uh, not only this topic, uh, but also these individual firms and and people. So maybe uh, maybe you can share with us what your thinking was behind that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so as some of you may know, um, we we're writing a series of three papers. Um, about the securities finance industry, where it came from, what its current situation is, and what the future may hold. And 
in writing that, it struck me that we are still solving for certain problems that cause friction in the securities finance. And while there are tools available to maybe um, solve for some of those problems, we were slow to, to, to take, take it up. And it's clear from all my research that we are on a cusp of, of a technology change. And my thinking was that these three firms have actually taken that leap of faith in that they are approaching this business from with, with the, the latest and newest technology. And, you know, we have to take notice of that. And I thought it was uh, worthwhile to hear from them. And it was pretty much as simple as that. Okay. Thank, thanks for that, John. Um, so now I guess what I really want to do is just get to the meat of it. So uh, maybe Boaz, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, about ShareGain uh, and what your sort of goals and objectives are. Sure. Um, so Sheridan was, you know, founded in 2015 um, with a clear view, right? Um, securities lending as an existing market, it's, you know, it's, uh, as we like to call it, it's, it's a, used to be a very much closed members club. It used to be um, very opaque uh, in terms of supply and pricing and mainly driven by systems that were designed, you know, 20 to 25 years ago. And the issue that it created that if you think about it, you know, securities lending, we always say it's a very basic right. It's an ownership right, your right to lend out a financial asset that you own. But in effect, um, if you think globally, there's about $120 trillion worth of securities. Um, and holistically, almost uh, only a half of it, you know, about 60 to 70 trillion uh, actually have access to the existing ecosystem. And that half is, you know, is, is more or less belongs or owned or managed by big financial institutions. So you're left with, you know, 50 to $60 trillion worth of securities that are sitting idle, collecting dust and self-collecting them and are unable to access the existing ecosystem and benefit from this, you know, right. Benefit, and, and from our point of view, we said, instead of trying to automate existing processes and try and teach uh, um, a financial institution that have access to the market, how to do it better or, or quicker or more automated, but how, if we build a solution that enables those who are, un, are unable to access the ecosystem, if we build the right solution that enables them to access the, 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 the existing ecosystem, then that becomes transformational because you drive wider adoption, and as we know, if you draw, drive wider adoption through technology, usually good things happen. Okay, great. Thank, thanks for that. And, and I think that's a point that we'll revisit because that is a, that, that's what it's all about. It is about giving access to people. And, and I, I, I love that. I love that idea. So, Gareth, uh, over to you now. Maybe you can tell us uh, about uh, why you, um, while, I while I change your name, uh, there we go. So now we got the right name and the right firm. Uh, Gareth, tell us a little bit about connection and and the, sort of the thinking behind it and uh, and what the goals are. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Um, I think you know, after after I sort of left um, City, um, I sat down with a couple of basically ex colleagues and friends, and um, and we looked at parts of the market that we've been in for a long, long, long time and what was working and what wasn't working um and you know i think that there had been various attempts in the past to try and come up with some sort of solution yeah and i think we've we've really focused more on the repo side initially um although that may not be where it all ends up but um and we looked at you know who is the, who are do, doing the business in this market and how are they you know transacting you know um very yeah and, and with this we actually went around and we spent a long time talking to a lot of the buy side um you know and the sell side but it was mostly the buy side just seeing you know how they were transacting business today you know and how they thought things could improve um and also we, we were looking at it from the point you know why what why is the market still in 20 or well, this at that point it was like 2019 or whatever um why is it so much of it still being done affecting in a very manual way and done pretty well the same way for the last 25 30 years um you know and and you know and from that you know i think we we realized that it, electronification has to happen and I think there have been people that have tried to address this in the past there has been uh, quite a lot of success 
bank to bank, um, but you know, sell side to sell side, you know, electronifying and also in turn, you know, using some sort of clearing product as well. But the the actual buy side was pretty well left out of that whole solution. Um, and then we said, well, why why are they not part of that solution? You know, it wasn't just that we're here. Here is a platform go and put your trades in. It was what solutions is that going to offer to them that they don't have today? Right. Um, Thanks. And I Gary. think that's where, that's where we sort of sort of what we try to do is address, you know, not only the electronification side of that, but also you know add solutions to to them. Okay, thanks, thanks, Gareth. And I think I think what I've heard really from the the two of you really is some common themes. You know, talking about sort of legacy infrastructure attitudes and approach, but also connectivity. Uh, so, so I think we'll explore that. So first, let me say hi to Mike. Mike is now in the house, and he is the first person that's admitted to watching from Germany. Uh, so uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. <laughs> thanks, Mike, for. Uh, for marking this this time with us. So, John, uh, maybe over to you. So that, that was kind of an interesting um, explanation from both of you. Um, and I think it was clear that you're coming from slightly different angles, but can I go back to, to the, the real sort of raison d'etre, if you like, as to what motivated you in the first place? So, Boris, if I start with you, was, I mean, I think you described that you saw um, a, almost a boys club of entrance and there is so much more opportunity for perhaps asset managers to come in directly. Was it the direct approach to the market that you were aiming at, or, or was it a combination of that and some other opportunity that you saw? Yeah, John, it's not necessarily just asset managers and it's not necessarily just a direct approach. We look at it much more holistically. At the end of the day, if you think about securities lending, right, it should be a no brainer. It should be something, you know, what we call risk adjusted return. Uh, extremely appealing, you know, most financial institutions have been doing it 40, 50 years. And then you ask yourself the question, so why are there so many others that are unable to benefit from that? And, and from our point of view, um, what we saw is that it just requires uh, um, too much infrastructure, too much, you know, creating a line, it, it as a line of business, and that becomes a barrier to entry. So we thought to ourselves, let's look at a few things. and. Let me let me digress a bit. One of the things that we've been, you know, shouting out from the rooftops from 2016. Now it's very timely, right? But we've been saying it's 2016. We said the biggest trend in capital markets, as we see it, is what we call private investor participation, right? We we saw it in 2016. We said there's huge demographic change. There's a huge technological barriers that are going down. If you recall, 2016 is when Robinhood just started. We said fees are going down. Technology creates a lot of access. Um, and, and, and demographics are changing, so so you know you've got the Gen Zs and the millennials that are you know happy and willing to trade um, much more and 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 through um, and through um, avenues like like Robinhood and the likes. Um, and we thought to ourselves, the thing is that these, while they have access to trading, they they don't really have access to what we call enterprise grade solutions. So if you think about securities lending, repo. Um, collateral management, you know, margin lending in, in or, or Lombard lending. And, and we thought to ourselves at the end of the day, we, and we've seen it with many industries, if you create uh, the, 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 the issue that, that, um, that was facing is that their custodians or their banks um, didn't, were very much focused on getting higher adoption and higher um, client base, but but they didn't have the expertise or the, the the technology to actually deliver or create, a, for instance, a securities lending desk as a line of business, right? And so we thought to ourselves, if we can create something um, that delivers the end-to-end -end agency solution, right? Um, what we call digital agent lending that enables those financial institutions to deliver securities lending as a feature to their underlying clients, then that becomes that's evolutionary in our business because and it's transformational because that enables them to very much quickly start you know on a plug and play start adopting it right and and when we looked at the existing market the biggest thing with the custodians um, that we saw today the biggest agents is that there was a gap right the, the biggest agents today um, the issue for them was that they have they can do a very good job and they do a very good job but they but they're as good as the omnibus account that they serve right. 
And if your Omnibus account that they serve is, is of a private bank that has 5 million clients, underlying clients, then they can only serve that Omnibus account. But then, but then that private bank needs to build a, what we call a fully paid program, right, internally. And that thing is, is a big piece of, of, of a project, right? They need to, in, in terms of in tech operations, uh, legal and everything else. And we thought to ourselves, if we can actually bridge that gap and create not only the digital agency lending, but also the entire tech stack, that if a financial institution, an online broker or a private bank comes to you and say, hey, I want to deploy securities lending and offer securities lending to my clients, we give them that tech stack, right? We give them that product that sits as an overlay with a, with a relatively easy integration. And then for them, it becomes a very appealing because they don't need to start with a two-year project, CapEx, OpEx, and building it and without even validating the, the, um, the potential. So in a sense, you're really coming to, um, as you say, securities lending as a service which is quite revolutionary, I must say, because, I mean, Gareth and I will both know the the sheer uh, conflict at times of growing a lending business, an agency business particularly, with assets that you don't really actually need because you already have them and they're not being fully utilised. Now, as you say that, I'm, I'm just thinking that I totally hear what you're saying and I totally actually endorse it, but is the market prepared to take on a lot more supply given that utilisation is, is where it is in the traditional sense of the market, can it absorb you bringing more assets to market? I think it's a great question. And the answer is, you know, just look at pre-08 and, and look at, and maybe look at, you know, look at what was what we're looking right now. Look at the, the differences between big pension funds and the online brokers, right? If you saw Schwab Interactive Brokers yeah. last year, right? Results, you know, 330 million uh, Schwab, 360 million, I think, Interactive Brokers, CalPERS on the other side, 100 million in terms of revenues, what more or less, yeah, don't, don't pick me on the, on, on the actual numbers, but, but as a whole, it just tells you the entire story, right? The market doesn't need another Amazon share, right? It doesn't need more GCs. It, GCs are 10 times oversupplied. But if you really think about, if you close your eyes, and I'm, uh, people tell me that I'm a bit visionary and, and, and maybe delusional, but if you really close your eyes, why wouldn't we live in a market where all supplies out there, right? If you think about special, well, we live in a, in a market today, securities lending is what you call supply constraint marketplace, but not on the GC space, on the specials, on the deep specials, right? A lot of agency and a lot of primes, what they spend most of their time is trying to re source more supply, right? Not about strategies, sourcing supply, finding the right supply. If you really, and, and, and it's a zero sum game, somebody holds that supply. If it's not a big pension fund, where does it, where the, who holds it? The ones who hold it are those, it's you and me, right? It's from ETF space and, 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 and the SPACs and the new IPOs and all of these stocks that somebody holds them. And the ones who hold them are private, mostly private investors, be it online brokers or private banks. So if you enable them to benefit from it uh, and open that thing, basically what you're delivering is you're delivering um, uh, lucrative supply to the market. Now, we saw it a lot with the algos, you know, I'm sure all of you share with me. It's like a chicken and an egg, right? If you bring stable, lucrative supply that's never been in, 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 in lending pools into the market, you might at the beginning um, overwhelm the demand. But if you have a stable supply, you know, the demand will come in, right? It will come in, be it algos, be it other, other um, strategies that, that require that, right? Yeah, no, gr um, great answer. And you're absolutely right. I mean, look at the retail uh, revenues generated um, by these online brokerages. It does tell a compelling story. Gareth, um, in um, one of the things that Roy and I joke about, but we're actually not joking, is that if we, we say that if we were given the opportunity to build, uh, let's say, an agency lending business from scratch, we wouldn't do it the way it is now. <laughs> and we would look at technology in a completely different fashion. Was, was the technology angle for connection really important as you went into this in that you recognize you were going to utilize something a bit different um yeah absolutely i mean i think we we, the, we needed something uh, and, and, and what we've come up with is uh, a cloud-based platform which was <coughs> very easy to actually you know put into client offices but at the same time was you know had the flexibility to provide the connectivity on, on either end of the trade yeah um and so <coughs> Yeah, so yes, the technology was very important, but it was really trying to focus on, you know, using that. Yeah, how can that technology 
help them you know with their current trading that they do today and trading they would like to do but they don't do today okay um and that really focused yeah I'm, I, yeah and it was really drilling down to, to some of these clients is why they didn't you know why they weren't that particularly active in the repo market or if they were active why was it very limited to you know a number of counterparties obviously most of those today was you know those counterparties are banks um the, those banks are providing you know that you know that credit intermediation to the market and also you know maturity transformation at times you know so but you know most of them you know we say well how how many counterparties do you have and they say oh we've got 30 gmras and i say well how many are you actually using and, you, and it came down a lot of these were only literally using really on a daily basis three or four of them yeah 80, yeah. 20, all right yeah yeah, uh, yeah and so you know their liquidity supply needs were really being provided by a very few you know um you know counterparties um and so we were sort of, so we would sort of drove into that one side was the legal one issue was the legal side that's you know it's relatively time consuming to to set up uh, you know a gmra relationship if you're a asset manager that actually is looking after you know, in some cases, hundreds of LEI you know, funds. You know, that's a lot of different agreements in place. You know, uh, you know, so that side we, fo we we focused on and found a solution for that. You know, and the other solution was looking at you know you know who they are trading with today and why they can't trade with other people, and then looking at some sort of credit solution surrounding that as well. So, Gareth, what's part of the sort of mission to introduce new participants or is this an is this a service to replace some tech for existing existing repo um, houses no i mean it's this is you know absolutely additive to what is out there at the moment in terms of it's not looking to replace anything you know you know, currently obviously you have you know asset managers those that are active in repo and by and by no means all of them are um you know you know that they you know, they rely on their few bank counterparties to 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 do um to to do their trades um with you know in some cases you have houses where that they're, they're pretty well one way in that repo those three uh, um repo trades in some in some cases you have houses where they're both ways you know um without currently a solution which will allow them to you know to you know without intermediating those trades via banks right banks using balance sheets okay yeah thanks for that okay great guys so look i i, I think that's just set up a, a whole bunch of other questions because i think gareth has touched on kind of the same point that boaz has in a, in a different way maybe boaz was talking about bringing in a wider community, giving access to a, a bigger universe of participants. And Gareth, you were talking about um, asset managers that might have a, a, a relatively small community of counterparties. And, and I'm, I'm curious whether, uh, whether we talk about anything enabling here more participation and more engagement and whether UMR is a driver. But before we go to that question, Alina has asked a, a question, uh, which is a really timely and topical one. Uh, Alina has asked, does share gain screen equity lending supply for ESG? So maybe, Boaz, you can start that off. And ESG obviously is something we, we might want to dig into a bit. Uh, Boaz, okay. there we um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So is, uh, Alina, thanks for the question. I think it's very timely uh, a couple of times. So firstly, um, when we when we say you know screening equity lending supply for ESG, um, obviously from um, we give our from from a lender perspective or what we call beneficial owner perspective, uh, we give them the ability to restrict whatever they want from, from a lending perspective. Um, they have a full dashboard. They can decide how much they want to lend from a NAV perspective. So there's a whole lending terms. We distilled, as I like to call it, you know, the entire lending terms and created it from a, a lot of documentation to about a three-minute, three to five-minute uh, um, uh, um, setup, which is fully customizable. 
So, so they can restrict whatever they want, right? They can decide um, that they don't want to lend specific securities from a specific country or from a specific um, um, or a specific security from a specific country um, or, or from a specific industry and so on. So there's there's and everything else again from we work with our clients. If there's a, something specifically that we call that is, can be featureized, then we, we we go and deliver it, and we pride ourselves for delivering. Uh, features fairly quickly um, now but I think ESG and, and you know um, Roy and, and, and obviously Beerpoint and obviously and Shagan as well we look at, at, at ESG and we look at the very um, we have a very strong opinions about it but we just launched like um, last week we launched a new product in ESG and we think that securities lending as a whole especially from, from uh, um, securities lending and ESG, everybody was focusing on the G, on the governance, right? We know the thing about proxy voting and we know everything about, uh, um, you, know, um, you know, restricting collateral schedules to make them that compliant and so on. But that was just dealing with, with, the, G, with the G part of ESG and, and especially with the, with the issue of making sure that ESG is compliant with securities lending. But we think, you know, again, with a view of, of, of a much broader, uh, uh, wider audience, we think that you know securities lending also needs to deal with the ENDS, right? And with that in mind, we launched a new product we call Better Lend, right? And Better Lend, we took a very, uh, I'd say, bold uh, step into saying not only you know we will help our client funnel some of the lending revenues into um, into causes that they uh, want to support creating good, right? So effectively taking some of the securities lending uh, uh, revenues and, and donate, donating it to specific uh, um, specific projects. Currently we have, uh, you know, clean water, renewable energy, reforestation and, 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 and education, right? And why we're so passionate about it is that at the end of the day, you know, leave cynicism aside, um, if you really enable, you know, I always remember that you know when 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 Amazon came live with Prime, right? The biggest feature that people love about Prime wasn't that was the fact that actually it it came in like a day a day afterwards, right? A day or two days. So they took care of all the hassle, all the logistics, and logistic is a lot. So if we as an agent decided to take it you know head on and say we will we will find the the, the charities, we will um, connect with them. Uh, through APIs, we will make sure that that the donation go the right way. We will um, 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 create the, the impact reports. We will follow them, and we will make sure that asset managers or wealth managers can actually have an, a securities lending which is ESG compatible, not just compliant. And we and and the and we just launched it last week, and and um, and we see already great uh, great feedback from the industry. Um, yeah, yeah. Th thanks for that, Boaz. I mean, look, the it, it kind of what you just described is is kind of in some ways similar to what Warren Buffett is alleged to have uh, described uh, ESG investing at. And he goes, "Look, my job is to make as much money for my investors as possible, and if I do a really good job." at increasing their investment returns, what they can do is take that money and support whatever efforts that they, uh, that they choose to, to uh, uh, invest in or donate to or support or, or whatever, whatever way. So it's interesting trying to combine the two. I think that's a, that's a cool approach. Um, I'll say something else, Roy, just to add. I think one of the things that people underestimate is that even if you have a big, so we have a client, a big asset manager, right? And they have a sustainable fund, they, they, they donate, right? But in order for the charity to actually donate, right? Uh, it's a, it's, you, need to, you need to submit the documents. It's a six month process. They don't, they don't um, donate less than a very big amount, right? Because they can't deal with the 2,000, 5,000, 3,000, 10,000, right? It's too small for them. So a lot of charities are being kept out and, 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 and the money's funneled to specific charities, right? But if you create a solution that enables, that takes, takes out the logistics, the logistics of it all and enables every month to donate or every periodic to donate small amounts that go into specific project that you can show them a product impact. I've lent my securities and my securities have now, have now actually um, 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 were, were funded a clean water well in Malawi, right? And that water well is on Beerpoint. 
right? And you can see, and there's a GPS, and there's the, the 300 children that it cost you 10,000 pounds. It didn't cost you uh, 50,000, right? That is a big impact, right? And and many a times where things fail is on the logistics. The, the vision is great, but the logistics is where everything fails, especially big financial institutions. So if we take care of the logistics and we don't charge anything from it, we think of it, this is what we call the new role of an agent in this world, right? Trying to help our clients, not just in securities lending, but things that are ancillary to it. So taking care of the logistics is a big thing. Right. Yeah, much appreciated for that. Uh, so look, Gareth, I want to turn to you because it's, uh, you know, oddly, uh, it, it is kind of a, a good segue. So you talked about beneficial owners or buy side institutions um, being able to access this kind of this wider community or, or currently they're kind of restricted into this small sort of network of counterparties, which they tend to deal with. So do you see your role as, as being an enabler there? And, and what are the what are the aspects of it that uh, that make it easier or make it more accessible or brings people together more effectively? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we do see ourselves as an enabler. You know, you know, I think you know, we developed the, the platform and the sort of products around it, you know, to uh, to allow, you know, um, people to you know, very quickly add new counterparties yeah uh, and that's been done by the legal structure that we put together um, and spent an awful lot of time developing um, which which allows them to you know effectively sign up to the platform sign up to the the legal structure um, and that allows them access to other counterparts on the platform with the same protection they would have if they had a single gmra um, so, so that is um, you know, that side you know for some has been very very attractive to them, you know, because they see you know they see how long it takes them when they you know they have a kind of identified a counterpart, how long it can be from that point to actually putting on that first trade, you know, and in some cases when we you know we went through doing all these various interviews with you know in some cases six months was a really quick turnaround, you know, beyond a year was probably the average. Um, you know, our platform. You know, you know, if they if they already if that account is or fund is already on the um, the platform already, it's, a, it's just a matter of effectively them approving that. You know, um, obviously still having to go through their their, their um, KYC and all the rest of it um, and credit analysis. Um, but you know. You know, the platform, you know, they can be up and running literally, you know, in a, f a few days. Um, so that side of it, I think, you know, we, we, we think, you know, has been one of the, you know, the key attractions. Um, but on the same time, there are, for various reasons, counterparts that they don't trade with today and in some cases can't trade with today um, because of either regulatory or you know credit rating status you know for instance money market funds are restricted to a repo to sort of a1 p1 um credit counterparties um you know if we, we've got a solution which will effectively allow them you know then to trade um you know with counterparts that don't have that credit rating right okay thanks for that so um appreciate that um uh, Oliver, we'll come to your question in in just a minute. I'm going to uh, I'm going to do a quick plug because this show is sponsored by PeerPoint. Um, and the thing that I want to talk about today, just very very briefly, is the PeerPoint Alpha community. So what we actually do is the 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 pack, as we call it, is a membership club. It's uh, strictly securities finance people. Uh, there are people in it now, I think, from uh, about 15 different firms that are members of it today in, as individuals or as corporate sponsorship. What we do are things like uh, monthly tutorials from experts. We do some premium editorial content. There's a community forum where people can ask questions. So the idea is to kind of share information. You know, I, I've, I've been talking quite a lot 
over the past week uh, uh, about a, a portfolio manager, a hedge fund that I spoke with last week, who said, I've been in the business 17 years. And I thought, wow, that's a long time. And then I realized that's only 2004. That means that they weren't in the market when the dot-com bubble burst or the uh, Asian uh, currency crisis or the, the Russian uh, bond crisis or the saving of bearings at the last minute, let alone uh, you know the uh, the Drysdale explosion that uh, led to uh, accrued interest being collateralized. So the idea of, of the pack is that people will have sort of a structured learning environment. So we've had uh, tutorials from on long short investment strategies from a portfolio manager. Uh, we've had uh, a session on pledge collateral uh, from Habib Matani of Clifford Chance. Um, uh, then we had uh, Ali Kazimi from Hansuki talk about not just securities, finance, taxation, but also ComEx. And we had quite a long discussion on that. And next week, we have Andrew Jameson from Citibank uh, presenting on ETFs and their role in securities finance. So the idea is a structured, continuous self-improvement program uh, so that every month you are a better securities finance professional than you were the month before. Um, so that's it. The pack is the uh, is the destination for that. And uh, now the uh, pitch is over, and I'll hand it back to John. Uh, you're still on mute, John. Damn, that's the first time I've done that in the last three, six weeks. But... Um... So, Boaz, Oliver asked a good question about the level of activity. So he's asking whether an asset manager um, can actually make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis or whether he can, like an agent would, sort of, or like he would with an agency program, outsource it to maybe uh, share gain to, to pull the trigger. So is there a level of, is there degrees of activity or, or, or is it... Um, you ask on every single occasion they have to approve because I understand that you are offering an agency basis um, product. Yeah, um, thanks Oliver for the question. Um, it's it's both, right? It's um, effectively, we call it the two, two, in two polars in shaking. Um, you can be very much as passive as you wish um, and we call it set and forget, right? So, uh, you know, you set out the terms and it can be on a company level or it can be on a fund level. So you built like a pyramid of, of, of hierarchies. And so, you, you know, um, for an instance, an asset management firm can decide something for, from a, from, from a firm-wide basis. And then each fund can decide, can have its own specific lending terms um, and, and, and they set it and again, fully, fully customizable um, and they set it and it runs. Or you can be very much active. So on the other side, you can have um, you can you can approve every trade uh, or every request to borrow. You can um, restrict it. You can you can um, uh, apply different minimum lending rates or so on. So it's each to his own in terms of the availability. We provide the flexibility to do if, both. Um, if, if do you have examples where, let's say, you have an asset management client that that requests to approve every trade? But then you will run into problems with it's gone to lunch, she's not there. There's delays that inevitably could appear um, that may lose the transaction. Well, back then, now we have all of our clients currently are, to, are now on what we call uh, um, auto approval, right? But we have, you know, it's very funny when you start, and when we saw that everybody were on 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 what we call prior approval, so uh, manual approval. Um, and they had like three times where it's the trade was sent out or trade requests were sent out in batches, um, three times, um, and, and approval and it, it goes into the dashboard and, and mobile and so on. Um, and there were issues that, that, um, that, that these trades were missed, right? Uh, only a few, but now once you get a bit more, what I, I think uh, as I like to call it more comfortable and, and again, it's all about trust and more confident in the system. What we've seen is that all clients turn out, you know, turn off the the the, the manual and turn on the um, auto approval. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense to me that if you've fine tuned your um, acceptability status for whatever, let's say nothing less than fifteen basis points, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you don't. They have another job to do. 
So I'd be surprised if they want to be that active, if they've set the parameters correctly. But this is but you're putting on the hat of someone who's been in security learning for a lot of time. Think about what we pride ourselves having, you know, about 80, I think 88 current stats, I think 86% of the supply that we have on our platform is, is totally new supply. They've never lent in their lives, right? Never been in lending programs, never lent in their life, right? So there's a huge educational curve, right? Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, you want to have like everything else, a lot of control, make sure that everything goes to like a four hour verification, checker maker and everything else. As you go more comfortable, you start, um, you start uh, building confidence on the process, on the system, on the agent, right? And, and, and it becomes much more uh, automated. Now, given that you mentioned that 86% is new supply, which is very interesting, um, how, are, how are they approved by the counterparties? I mean, do you run into credit issues or is there a solution for that? We used to. So when we started, um, and that was a bit of a pivot that we did back in 2018, we started with, you know, funnily enough, we had a big vision and we started, said, let's start with um, ultra high net worth individuals and family offices, right? <laughs> you know, if you think about it, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's it's almost it's almost you know you think about it, semi-professional investors, seeing on 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 you know big investment portfolios, you know, why wouldn't they? How hard can it be? <laughs> well, it turns out that it's extremely hard. You know, if it's a non-regulated entity running exactly into the credit uh, uh, and and so on, um, and there's a great saying uh, uh, if you think about a tech company, if you you've seen one family office, you've seen one family office, right? It's totally non-scalable, scalable, and, non -repeatable. and so um, we uh, so we pivoted into small and medium asset managers into actually going into their wealth managers, uh, their private banks, their online brokers, and and giving it to them, building for those financial institutions that custody for these private clients, building uh, like a fully paid pro, giving them a fully paid program, right? And, and then it's a regulated entity um, and it's much easier regulated entity, be it a private bank or an online broker. And then it's much easier for, with, um, uh, with the counterparties. Got it. Right. So thanks. Thanks for that, Boaz. I, look, I, I think it's all about, you know, you, first of all, you, you talk about a journey. The truth is uh, in today's world, we all have to adapt and adjust. We have one idea and that's about, uh, what works and what doesn't work, keep what works and then, uh, you know, uh, adapt, adapt the rest. Um, so thanks. Uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch as that goes along. Gareth, uh, one of the things that you talked about uh, a few minutes ago, I, I want to explore a little bit more. First of all, I don't expect you to give away any kind of, any kind of secrets, uh, you know, <laughs> as part of this, but uh, what, what you and Boaz are both doing is trying to make, the market's more accessible to more participants. So, so I get that, and uh, and that makes sense. But one of the things you also talked about, um, can can you share more about where you say, look, we have we have ways of enabling new activity to happen that people can't transact today. So, can you maybe explore that without uh, uh, without uh, like revealing too much? Um, well, I, yeah, as I've said, yeah, I, I think you know that there are. Certainly, you know, there are entities that are restricted by either regulation, credit rating, or just their interpretation of who they want to do business with, with to only trade with counterparts that you know, that have a minimum credit rating, yeah, um, and that's been around for pretty well ever, um, you know, and you know, we we looked at you know, is there a way of providing that solution? Now, you know, obviously, if you, know, you know, if you look at the agent lending world, a lot of agent lenders have provided some sort of counterparty identification. Um, um, you know, we this what we're doing is something slightly different, but it's you know, it's it's really you know, achieving something um, the same. Um, and that's probably as far as I'm going to sort of really go into the nitty gritty of that. So I'm very happy to talk to anyone who wants to come to us, um, you know, how that actually works in detail. Great. Th thanks for that. And I'm certain that, Boaz, you'd also welcome people to uh, to give you a call and talk about uh, 
just about everything we've talked about. One of the things both of you have talked about, though, is technology. And I don't know whether uh, David Schoen uh, is still in the audience. Uh, David was uh, was our guest yesterday. Uh, sorry, yesterday. It feels like yesterday. Last Wednesday on the show. David's from uh, Isla, where he's responsible for the uh, the CDM project and digital transformation. So I'm curious whether you guys have encountered uh, – you know, technology as an enabler with your end customers, or or have people been hesitant to adapt to uh, sort of the, the the new technology environment we're in? Uh, maybe maybe we can start with you, Boaz. Yeah, um, you know, I the first few there's a uh, there's a great saying uh, by Jeff Bezos that was on our plaque on our old office, which innovation requires a long term willingness to be misunderstood, right? And when we started in, in Shagan, everybody looked at us and said, they're mad, right? They'll never be able to crack it. And, and, and we came on with a microservice architecture and think about it, we spend about, you know, to date about $20 million, right? And, and, and this is like building a, and, and it's never ending story, right? And, and what we always said that if you build it right, um, they will come. Right, because we know the problems in the in this ecosystem, and we know the real issues, and and like everything else, you know, Roy, um, it's all about the people, right? So, so we were, uh, you know, as a competing with the big agents, um, uh, but but not really competing because we were looking at a totally different niche that the, the, that the, the agents weren't looking at or couldn't actually um, couldn't actually uh, uh, um, roll out their solution to. And then came in, you know, like everything else, like another visionary, and it's in the public domain, you know, City. City chose to collaborate with Chagan and, and, and chose our solution. Um, and 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 it's all about, you know, a vision, right? Somebody somebody saying, okay, we can go and build it, but actually there's a, there's someone who's actually built it already and they're doing a very good job at it. So can we can we use them and can we roll it out? Um, and that was really the first time I think that an agent, a big agent lender, actually is um, using a third-party technology to roll out a new product in securities lending. Think about it, right? Um, having rolling out a new project, uh, a product, not only the the existing uh, agency lending for big beneficial owners, but also a productized digital securities lending offering for wealth management. And I think that was a bit of a validation of, 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 of the fact that Chegan, in terms of technology, is actually a big business enabler. And, and from a client perspective, it's not about the technology per se, right? It's all about the, 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 the mindset, right? We, we as a company have a mindset of proactiveness and a mindset of yes, we can. So when clients come in and say, oh, I need that report, oh, I have this new thing, oh, we just integrated a new system and, and, and there's a thing here, then we, you know, we try and look at it. And many a times we solve the problems, right? We roll out a new feature, we roll out a new thing. Yesterday we rolled out a new, uh, uh, a new Bowell dashboard. Think about it like um, uh, from, not just from the supply side, from the beneficial owner, from, from the prime side. And I can get into it and talk about it for ages, but it's all about, and it came from really listening to the users. What do the users really want, right? What do the users really look for? Um, and I find that when you actually, you're customer centric and you're listening to what your client actually wants um, and you're technology driven, so you can actually deliver that thing, it creates wonders, right? But it takes time, you know, security is lending like everything else. It just, it, it takes time and another iteration, another iteration, and we're, but we're very patient. Uh, thank, thanks, Boaz. Um, Gareth, I mean, uh, you, the way you described at the beginning, it was really in response to kind of things that you were hearing or had experience of in the market. So technology and your users, customers, and prospects, I mean, how wh what what's that experience been like? Um, well, I think, there is no sort of standardization, you know, when, when we've gone around and talked to a lot of different asset managers, they all seem to have done a repo slightly differently. Um, but but by far the majority, yeah, that their technology supporting that repo product is not particularly uh, encompassing. Yeah, I think, you know, it's developed over many, many years yeah, where it's had that manual trading intervention, you know, either via a Bloomberg or a voice um, call or whatever, you know, which is then going into something, you know, you know, 
you know, the asset managers you know, have all invested millions and millions and millions on all these very all-encompassing asset management systems, um, you know, and whether that's an Aladdin or a whatever it is, you know, the, you know Charles River, they've all got, you know, those asset management systems are very, very good at looking after the trading side of asset managers. I think when it came to actually doing the repo side, it's been in most cases almost sort of levered in somewhere, you know, and it hasn't worked particularly well. And you know, <coughs> and a lot in a lot of cases, they use this sort of all encompassing, wonderful repo system called Excel. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so yeah. So I think the you know, I you know. But part of it's been obviously that that trade is you know it's being done on a Bloomberg chat or it's been done and you know and it's had no way of getting into their systems apart from they're they're sitting there rekeying it, you know. Um, so obviously our platform will provide that you know various ways that they can bring that trade, you know, you know from a very simple file transfer to you know an API or whatever, you know, to bring that into their system. So you know that takes away that manual intervention, you know. But with um, electronification comes some form of s standardization. Yeah, and again, you know, every, yeah, everyone has developed their own ways of doing things internally, you know, and that's the way they've done it. You know, and when you say, well, here's the solution, you know, we, we, you know, we can give you it this way, this way, that, that way, um, but you might have to do something here to make that work. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think at a headline level, we've seen that results from SFTR, where at the at the starting point, everything matches uh, from a trading point of view. But the, you know, the reality is that the life cycle events interpreted slightly differently at almost every firm, and so there's yeah. no standardization. And the reason yeah. I mentioned David's name a, a few few minutes ago, the opening of that question was because. Uh, the reality is what we need is more standardization from the industry because standardization mm -hmm. then allows people to differentiate their their products right we shouldn't be we shouldn't be we shouldn't be differentiating based on our post trade i do it this way you do it that way this is my workaround that's your workaround we should be differentiating ourselves based on the products that we offer and so long as there are not, there's a lack of standardization in the in the post trade world, we're going to have problems. So, uh, one of the challenges for David in leading the CDM is, you know, getting everyone on board with that and uh, and committing money to move forward. Um, John, I think you wanted to. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, you've actually just kind of answered the question I was going to ask, but because I think I think it's fair to assume that we talk a lot about in the industry about CDM and is there is championing the cause. Um, with some with some gusto on that because I think it's I think as Gareth just mentioned I mean a lack of standardization is certainly a, a barrier to solving some of these frictional issues that we all suffer from that aren't particularly contentious um, smart contracts is that actually is, is a way I would start but I did want to ask and it's a shame we don't have Guido but we'll we'll, we'll probably get him on another t another time um, following on if we achieve a wide adoption of a of a CDM type model for securities finance. To me, the inevitable future step beyond that is actually the adoption of DLT as a means to conduct this business. Do you both think that's likely to happen? I was going to say in your lifetimes, but I don't want to be that cynical. But do you think that is an inevitability? And what's your timing on that if, if at all it does actually happen? Boas, oh, so if I can start with you. Yeah. Um... So the short question is yeah. The short answer is yes, definitely. So we think um, the, re the, the, the step change of this industry will happen when when settlements, you know, when you have like real time settlements or, or near real time settlements on the ledger, right? That will change this entire industry from a secure on a securities lending point of view, right? Think about payments. Think what happened to payments back then when you did it through SWIFT, and now like the, and now with you know doing and now SEPA and ACH and all these things, whether in the US or, or here in Europe, when it's almost instantaneous, how it just, it, it, it totally um, turbo boosted the entire market. So we think that the, the, the big technological new change um, in securities lending is when settlements will, um, will be real time or near real time on the ledger. Um, 
you know, I always said that, you know, I, 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 I said it back in 2019, I think like 2025 is the year. Why 2025? Because in my mind it takes about, you know, five to seven years back when we just started talking about DLT where you can have a standard, um, uh, an industry standard right, approved, right? And if you think about it, I look at it as the change to uh, mobile, uh, going from 3G to 4G. There were a lot of technology competing on 4G, but every now and then 4G, but 4G is actually LTE, right? There were a lot of technologies that were competing, uh, LTE, WiMAX, and everything else. And the industry as a whole took it a long time to actually um, wrap around um, LTE, and then LTE became the technology. And now everybody talks about 4G, but there's a technology behind it. Once the technology, everybody now still trying to build their own distributed ledger, their own way to settle things at uh, different exchanges. But once the entire industry, um, uh, um, agrees and 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 standardizes um, um, the, the right technology uh, to settle um, securities on a ledger. You know, securities lending will uh, the inevitable consequences is that it will be everywhere, right? Instantaneous, and and that will be the next evolution of our industry. Thanks for that. That's um, very interesting. Um, some thoughts there, Gareth. Are you need any any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I, I agree that yeah, at some point in the future, and obviously, yeah, as you sort of said in our lifetime, I'm probably a bit closer to the end of mine than some of us on this panel. But um, the um, yeah, it's got to start though from you know the actual trading in those markets. Yeah, you know, you know we, I don't think we could we can't impose our you know, you know di digital. Um, ledger on top of you know something that's not digitized already, so you know it's got yeah you know, we can follow it, but I don't think we can start it. You know, so it's got to go back to you know what you know, what, you know how you look at how custodians are holding securities you know in their various local markets. That's the first point that's got to go. You know, once that starts moving, you know custodians having these huge omnibus accounts. You know, you know, in their own books, which are then, you know, you know, which are held in these single markets. You know, how do you split all those client assets? Well, that's held in the custodian's record. So, you know, if you can start solving for that, then you know, you know, we absolutely can, you know, you know, sit on top of that. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, Gareth. Um, look, we're running out of time, so I'm going to hand back to uh, to Roy. You're on mute, Roy. I am on mute, which is much better than uh, I was last Saturday. Uh, so every Saturday I do a securities lending fundamentals. Um, uh, that's the uh, that's a chat I do it at YouTube at one p.m. on uh, on Saturdays uh, for two weeks in a row. I have managed to start both programs for between five and twenty minutes with the sound off. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, a few seconds of, of mute. I'll live with that. Um, I uh, there were lots of people that sort of carried on watching, and so I appreciate that. But what we're doing for the next eight Saturdays uh, at one o'clock is going through the fundamentals. So this week it's about characteristics and statistics from the business. So I'll focus on that. It's half an hour. It's on YouTube, uh, as you can see. The uh, um, the uh, URL is Roy Live. Um, so I. Uh, who knows where I came up with that? Um, but look, I, I think this was, uh, I found this really, really interesting. I apologize again to uh, Guido from HQLAX. Uh, I, uh, unfortunately, the link that I gave him uh, didn't work. So uh, as uh, John said, we will definitely have them on for a future episode, but uh, appreciate the efforts that, that you made in the prep and, uh, and trying to get in. But Boaz, Gareth, uh, that was fantastic. John, this episode was your idea. So my question to you is, uh, did this meet the uh, objectives that you hoped it would? It certainly, um, with some of the comments made by, by both gentlemen, um, it solves some of my questions, actually, as to what the thinking is behind where this thing is heading. And I also thought it was quite innovative in that, look, we know that there are there is some problems, fundamental problems with the way that the market methodology and modus operandi is structured. And here are two firms that have looked at that and taken it slightly, taken a different view. 
and their success will actually dictate as to where this thing's going to go with maybe new entrants in the future. So I think, um, from my point of view, these are two firms to watch. And if Guido was here, I'd say three. Right. So thanks for that. Um, look, it just uh, leaves uh, it for me to say thank you, Boaz. Thank you, Gareth. And thank you, John. And very much thank you for the viewers. Uh, we appreciate this. If you think this is good, please give us a, a like or a uh, subscribe or whatever platform you're watching on, whatever the good thing is. Um, if you have negative comments, just email me and I'll, 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 I'll deal with them. Um, but look, I appreciate your time. We're here every Wednesday at 10 a.m. BST uh, and Saturdays at one o'clock. I hope to see you there. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, if you're seeing it in the replay, we do reply to all of the comments, uh, whether they were done live or in the replay after the show. So thanks very much and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.